Then there was the locks. That, that used to be fun because some of us used to go ship spotting. You know where kids go um, train spotting or aeroplane spotting? We used to go ship spotting. You could buy books. Um, Ian Allen used to produce these books of all the ships and we used to go down the locks and sit there. We'd go around to Rymel Street. There was a library in Rymel Street. Look at the Lloyd's List and Journal Commerce, see what ships were coming in. We'd go down the locks, get the tides. There was no point in going down there at low tide because there'd be nothing happening. God, you did your research, didn't you? Well, not really, because we, we grew up around, you know, with the ships and what else have you. Mm-hmm. And we'd sit down there and watch the ships and come from all four corners of the globe. Of course, you used to get the big ones coming, like the Dominion Monarch. They're not the biggest ever coming here, but they were quite big. She was saying, you know, these big, huge ships, marvellous. It was a good day out for us. Good evening, everybody. That was Owen McCornish talking about going to see the ships when he was a child growing up in Silvertown and North Village. And that is exactly the theme of uh, this evening. We are talking about memories of people growing up in the Royal Ducks area. So welcome to episode four of the Islanders. We are live on the Thames Festival Trust Facebook page and I think you can watch us also on YouTube. As I said, today's theme is exploring memories of growing up in North Woolwich and Silvertown. And to do that, we are in very good company. We have Robert Rogers from the Newham History Society. Uh, Robert has spent many, many, many afternoons as a kid exploring the dogs area as a child and has a lot of memories that he will share with us tonight. We have Dave Fennessy, also born in the area, um, founder of the very, very, very popular and my first place to go when I need help, Facebook group, North Woolwich and Silvertown, past and present, where thousands of people uh, share every day the memories of living, working and growing up in the area. So if you have not joined yet, I do recommend you to join the uh, Silvertown and North Woolwich past and present Facebook group, either if you live or lived in the area or if you want to find out more about what it meant to, for people to live or be born in Royal Dogs. And we have Lisa, I, Lisa, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Lisa, there, what do we? I think I didn't. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lisa is uh, from the uh, Museum of Youth Culture and she very, very, very recently um, also coordinated a project uh, about growing up in the Royal Dogs and she has a lot of memories and stories that she collected during her research that she uh, is also very keen on sharing with all of us this evening. We were supposed to have Victor Turner, who also spent many days as a child visiting the docks where many, many, many of his uh, family members worked. Uh, he is also the son of Vic Turner, a uh, docker trade union leader who went from being in prison to becoming mayor of Newham, but he is having some technical difficulties and he has been unable to join us uh, so far. I'm gonna have all my settings open. So if I see that he can sort out his problems, I will be ready to welcome him back on the TV studio. Uh, And of course we've got you. So if you are watching this live, Please, please, please participate. Leave a comment with your question for Bob or Dave or Lisa, or leave a comment to share with us any memory that you have from growing up in Royal Dogs or from visiting Royal Dogs. Or if you know somebody who grew up in Royal Dogs and they have passed the stories to you, please leave a comment and let us know about some of those stories, memories, anecdotes, or just let let us know from where you're watching us this evening. So I do look forward to reading all of your comments at the end of the show. And of course, we are going to have a lot of photos uh, that we will use to trigger some of those memories. And some of those photos are in today's musical video.
Right, so ready for round one of photos and memories. I love this photo because uh, in only one photo, it represents very well what we're talking about today, which is you've got children and at the other side of the fence, you can already see the sheep, uh, the silhouette of the sheep and the funnel. So, uh, I mean, just thinking about what the royal dogs were, all the sheep, all the noise, all the activity. What was it like for children to grow up under the silhouette of the dogs, the cranes, all the activity, all of the bars? Dave, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, as a child, I don't ever remember um, sort of being in a pram and then sort of suddenly looking around and saying, what the hell is all this about? <laughs> you, sort, you you grow up with it and you, you take it as, you know, just what, what your world is. Uh, the difference is, is when like a friend or outside family used to come down and they would say, you know, wow. this, is, <laughs> this is unique. How do, you, how do you live here? Isn't it really noisy? I don't really remember the docks being that noisy in... Um, well, there was a lot of road traffic, of course, all the time. Um, but it was all fenced in, so that used to absorb a lot of the sound. Um, I, no, I don't think they were that noisy. Obviously, New Year's Eve, they used to all let their horns off uh, all at once, which was all right if you liked it, that sort of thing. Um, I guess if you didn't know anybody that worked in the docks, uh, immediate family it was it was like a mystery to most people because you couldn't really see into it unless you went up in the flats to have a look but no, i don't remember it being that noisy not from where we were anyway but as a child weren't you captivated by the by the shape the, the vision of the ships because i mean a lot of the ships were so big that you could see them from a lot of people have said I went. I used to go to bed, and I could see the ships from my window, even from the other side of the fence. I, I'm thinking, if I was a child growing up in the area, just like the clip we we had at the beginning, like people, children used to go and see ships. I would be like fascinated, like wow. Or is it something that it was so much part of your environment that you weren't as shocked as as yeah as mesmerized as I would be? For example, it was just part of your life. I mean, I used to get more shocked when I used to see trees and grass. Um, <laughs> that was a bit of a shocker. No, it's just you. You grow up, you see it, you take it for granted, and you think, "Well, this is where I live. This is my microcosm." Um, but other places were always more interesting to me because they didn't look like where I lived. If that makes any sense. Were you aware of how? important that the royal dogs were as a child like you, you saw them and as you said for you they were part of your uh street furniture if you want uh were you aware were you have, were you told that we live by one of the biggest ports in the universe i certainly wasn't told that by my school um i think i've already said i didn't go to drew road i went to the one down the road they didn't do anything about the docks or local history um, for some strange reason. So, um, no, I really didn't think about it in that way, not until later on when I could actually, you know, read about it and realise what was going on. I suppose I was a bit ignorant, really, as a child, but um, I'd like to hear, you know, other, other people's views if they thought it was special or just every day. Yes, please. So if you are watching this live and you grew up in Royal Dogs, please do, do leave your comments about what did it mean for you to grow up in the area? How do you feel? What do you think when you were a child and you saw all of the activity and the cranes, the cranes and the sheep? And personally, now that we know how important they were, how proud, how do you feel having lived in that area? Like it was the biggest, biggest port in the world and everything that the Royal Dogs meant. Uh, Bob, would you like to share some thoughts with us? Yes, it's... Um... I mean, I originated out of Poplar. Um, I was actually christened St. Matthias, which was an East Indian church. Um, again, the boats were just day-to-day -day thing. You didn't, you didn't actually assumed everybody else had boats as well. Uh, we had some relations come down from, from Birmingham once, and they said about, as Dave was saying, they said about the noise of the ships. Well, we didn't notice it. The only time you'd notice a, a noise from a ship was sometimes 
um, you'd hear a slightly different um, horn, chip's horn on the wind sort of thing. And it was um, it was either a new boat or as a stranger coming into port, might have his load may have shifted or something, and he was having to come into port. And I couldn't wait my granddad to get home. He, well, they, my great grandfather was a docker, but my grandfather were in and around the docks. And I couldn't wait for granddad to get home, find out if there's some new boat had come in or new ship had come in. But no, it, it was just a a natural thing. I mean, same with old years night, the ship horns, you recognised it. And and the boats, I mean, the, the Royal Docks and the Silvertown Way was known also as the gateway to the Empire. Uh, I learnt more geography from leaning over a dock wall and I did ever at school and old Mr Cooper, my old geography teacher at Victoria, did a wonderful job. But again, they never really covered local history or ships, although we did once do the PLA, used to do school trips and you used to ha get a boat round around the docks. But we only ever did that once. Lisa, what is your experience of people who talk to you about growing up in the area? What have you learned it meant for them to grow up there? A little bit the experiences that Bob and Dave have spoken about, and that they mention it and they'll, they'll talk about it, but almost in passing, and this kind of knowing that, I guess in hindsight, you might realize that it was so special and it was, you know, such an important site. But as they were growing up, it was more about what was going on on the streets with their friends and their community. But I do love this little quote that I pulled out from Glynis, who, who went to Drew Primary, and um, she said it was right by the docks, and the school had adopted a ship called the the Glen Orkey, which was part of the Glen Line, and the school had a flat roof, so each time the ship came in or came out of the dock, the whole school would go and gather on top of the roof, and they'd be singing hymns, um, those in her on the sea, sing, things like that, uh, and that would kind of be like part of her experience going to school, which I thought was really nice, but I think that's one of the, the few ones where, the, where it specifically got mentioned, as like talking about some of the ships that came in and out, uh, and kind of how, yeah, how aware people were of that. Thank you. Let's go to the uh, next photo. And that's a street party in the Royal Docks. I think this is uh, Constance Street, the 1953 coronation party. Uh, um, it's not that I want to flatter you, but uh, Bob, Dave, and of course, Lisa, you might be a bit too young to remember having been in the 1953 coronation parties. But Street parties were, however, a very, very big thing uh, in the area, were part of the fabric of the area, an excuse to celebrate everything and anything and get together with people out on the street. And of course, a big day for children and young people, a great opportunity to, to have fun. So what can you tell me, if not about this specific photo, about street parties that you remember in the area when you were... Uh, teenagers, young kids, children. And of course, that was from the days when all streets looked like that in Silvertown and North Village, a long row of old Victorian houses. Um, if you look at that photo, that's if that is Constant Street, then that must be Levi's um, Rag and Bone Man's yard on the right-hand side that has been transformed into a lovely castle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, every, every street used to really make uh, an effort. I don't think they... You know try to outdo each other but it was it was they wanted to do the best they could for their kids mostly um and you're, you're quite right i'm 59 next month so i, I don't quite remember the, the coronation but they did it it did carry on as a tradition with the original ferry festivals they used to have uh, a big street park in, in camel road um well, that's the only one I know of because that's where I used to live. But yeah, they did have street parties alongside the ferry festival. Very important to bring in the community together. Uh, even the ones you didn't want to join in, you know, and who were grumpy <laughs> at the curtains, they would almost certainly join in by the end of the evening. And uh, it was a great thing to behold. They actually, I think they had one quite recently in Savile Road. Um, maybe yeah. two, three years ago. A couple of years ago, yes, that's correct, yes. So obviously yes. it's still in the blood around there, so they, they want to start doing a few more maybe. Not just wait for a, a big occasion to come along, but just, just do it. Just get some leaflets out and put them through people's letterboxes and, and away you go. 
I'm sure a lot of people are taking notes and as soon as COVID is over, we all are going to have so many reasons to celebrate and get together. Uh, Bob, uh, street parties in the area, what do you remember? Well, I was born in August 53, so I missed that as well. But, um, <laughs> now, it, it used to be um, not so much a party as like the big coronation parties were, but you would very often have street events with, with families getting together, mainly because the houses were so small, you couldn't really get three or four families and a load of squabbling kids all in a small house, so you'd have the party in the streets. I mean, a, another group that used to ha have the big event was the Catholic Church. They would have the big parades uh, every year, and they would have the a lot of altars would be displayed outside the houses. So that was a, another street party t type event. But street parties as such, it's, I don't ever remember us having a big one like that at all. We did try to organise it once for the Queen Silver Jubilee in 1977, but the police decided, that was the time we well, was living in Cannon Town, the police decided our road was too important as a, an overflow road if there was a major incident on the Barking Road. So we were told, no. <laughs> As my mum's job was to organise it. She wasn't very popular, but it wasn't her fault. <laughs> Lisa, have you been uh, talked about street parties, celebration on the street with neighbours, with community members, as part of your research? Definitely, definitely a lot. I, I think, as always saying, mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the thing that people have really spoken a lot a lot about is this kind of the community coming together and everyone in the street knowing each other and always having people around that you can count on and, and that kind of the street parties and festivals are kind of be a way of everyone getting together now we haven't actually had anyone tell us anything about the coronation but there's this brilliant story from the silver jubilee um from Ginny, and she was a bit of a rocker and um she also talked later about helping organize some of the later fairy festivals but when they have had the Silver Jubilee, um, they, they put on a street party and um, it was absolutely pouring it down with rain. It was terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible weather. Um, Typical. Now, they a block of flats. Typical, I know, right? Um, but they're right by the block of flats in River Town that you could walk underneath. So they kind of set up all the uh, tables in there and they kind of had the party anyways. Uh, but Ginny's brother, uh, he was a drummer in a rock and, ball, rock and roll band. Um, uh, the eldest brother John was a drummer, and the younger brother Eddie was on guitar. Um, and they played that street party, but they couldn't fit underneath the uh, kind of walkway. So they were out in the pouring rain playing this gig as it was raining, which I thought was really funny. Um, but yeah, a lot of people talk about kind of those street parties. I mean, the fairy festival, of course, being the main one that people have talked about, and then the silver jubilee. But no one's, no one's shared memories from the coronation and uh, although the weather is not ideal um we are having a very weird summer this summer let's get a bit summery uh because it is absolutely possible and has been possible for decades and for generations of people in the royal docks to go to the beach in North Woolwich and Silvertown. This photo is from 2018 uh, when we had the beach in a Royal Victoria dock. Uh, but it's not the first time that people in the Royal Docks have gone to the beach. And uh, in fact, um, I think some people call the area uh, as a joke in the summer when we do this kind of things, Costa del Woolwich. Uh, me and my neighbors used to to call it Costa del Becton. And as I said, people have been doing this for decades, if not centuries. Um, and this photo, I'm not sure the date, but pretty sure it looks like late uh, 19th century. And Bob, I wasn't sure where this photo, uh, which I found in the North Willits, uh, and Silvertown past and present uh, Facebook group came from. I think you did have a better idea of where this photo comes from. Yeah, it, it could well be. Peter Box has written two wonderful books on the paddle steamers on the Thames, one called Paddle Steamer of the Thames and one called Bell Steamers of the Thames, because that is a bell steamer in the background. 
their bell steamers would go from um, the, the pier by London Bridge, uh, by Tower Bridge, sorry, and would go all the way to Yarmouth. Um, they were sometimes referred to as husband boats because if the family was going away on holiday, the father would very often have to work in the city in the morning. So I would pick a steamer up in the afternoon and get to Yarmouth at like five o'clock in the morning. Uh, and they would stop at, off at Lower Stoff and Southwold. In fact, Clacton was created uh, solely for that purpose. That they'd worked it out that it was the same distance from London as Margate. So it was created as a seaside resort by the paddle steamers. Mm -hmm. They were steaming for pleasures because not only was it a, a trip, um, a lot of the, the piers, people would promenade along the piers um, in their Sunday bests to see the boats coming in. Uh, usually we get end of pier shows from literally the same thing. Somebody thought, I oh, know what we'll do, we'll set up a show at the end of the pier and people can pay money to see a show. So you get end of the pier shows. Uh, say so Clacton was created out of the paddle steamers. It, it, it created a world of um, entertainment, also a world of where people were obviously not flying off to Spain and all the rest of it and might only get a, a week's holiday. They would um, go down to the seaside resorts by boat. So it created entertainments as well. Plus, obviously, in that part of the world, you've got the Princess Alice disaster where a boat coming back from... Um, Gray's End um, at the park there was hit by a collier and sliced in half. Uh, they reckon about 800 people were killed. They don't know the exact uh, figure because what happened was, although parents were counted, adults were counted getting on, children were not. And remember in those days, big families would sometimes have six or seven children. And again, this might be their only uh, holiday out for the whole of the summer. So all the kids would go as well. So no idea how many were lost, but mm -hmm. that was, uh, you can still do, well, pre-COVID today, shall we say, the, uh, there's a paddle steamer comes down. The Waverley. Uh, Waverley, yeah. yes, yeah. For, for, um, Glasgow, she goes around the country. So yeah. you can actually do a paddler from from the tower down the south end. Uh, and I think it goes right down to Clacton now, but you only get about half an hour there. And, and, and passing North Woolwich, passing oh, the yes. site. Well, this of, is it. They, they would yeah. stop at North Woolwich. They would also stop at the mouth of the River Lee. Um, mm -hmm. There, I mean, the boats going from from that part of the world would, would go to Australia as well. Obviously, not a paddler, mm -hmm. but so people would would get the, the boat from there to Australia. So that was all the way along. So the, the river was. River was literally, as the PLA books calls it, the liquid highway. <laughs> and going back to my, my question was more about the origin of this this photo. Uh, so yes, so, um, but thank you to Rob well, for say, in, in Peter's books, there's quite a few photos yeah. like this, and the writing on them is the same type of yeah. writing. So it's obviously from that that same part of the world. M mystery solved. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you for telling us a bit more about the blue. Uh, the Vell steamer pier in uh, in North Woolwich. So the, we have the living proof here that yes, people have been going to the beach in North Woolwich since uh, nearly 200 years ago. This photo, uh, I believe, Dave, is yours, or at least you posted this one. You posted this one in the um, uh, North Woolwich and Silvertown Past and Present Group, and you mentioned. And a lot of people commented, this is the beach where I spent a lot of afternoons and evenings as a child, as a teenager. Uh, this photo is mine. Uh, but again, I have seen a, a, a photo of the sim a similar location, again, in the um, Silvertown and North Woolwich past and present group. And a lot of people have commented about this location and places like this. I spent so many afternoons, summer evenings, swimming or going with my boyfriend or my girlfriend, having a first case. So what can you guys tell me about going to the beach in North Woolwich? Who wants to go first? Well, that looks like Barge House Road Slipway. It is indeed. It, and that's what it looks like. Now, you used to be able to, I know it's a bit of a stupid thing to do, but at low tide, you could walk right the way down that slipway, right out, and you'd literally be 100 yards off the shore. 
uh, a bit of a mad thing to do because of a large ship come around. You'd you'd, <laughs> you'd be in trouble. But the point is, at low tide, large ships didn't come around. So the most you'd more like get would be a little tug whizzing along. Uh, he didn't stay out there long. He wasn't that daft. But that was um, Barge House. And so there was a bit of a beach there. I never remember actually going there to the beach. I remember going to the beach at Tower Bridge, which is another story altogether. But I don't even remember, remember the beach down there as such. Well, certainly not with people on it. Dave? Well, I don't know if Bob used to get the same, but we used to get the river police coming round to our school to do a little demonstration, uh, show us a, a film of people getting into trouble. They said, don't play on the banks of the Thames. It's a really <laughs> stupid, dangerous thing to do, um, let alone jumping in and swimming in it. I mean, if anybody doesn't believe about the theory of evolution or natural selection, you've only got to look at the kids who used to jump in there and it all comes through. It all comes to your face. Only really, really stupid people used to jump in the Thames. Um, but as for that pier, I love the fact that it still exists because that was the, the first um, Woolwich Ferry pier um, that the railway used to run. That was, It preceded the free ferry by a good few years. And it's still there now. I presume it's because it's going to be quite costly to get rid of it. I don't think they've got any plans for it because it's in a pretty bad state. But I look at it and I, I can just, you know, I soak up the history that the railway steamships used to use that one. Um, and then, of course, the free ferry came in and they used to run side by side um, for quite a few years until but that railway ferry cost a penny to go on. But the other one was free. But it lasted quite a few years. It was passenger only. Uh, whereas the other one, you could get, you know, a car, awesome car on there and whatever. But um, I, I wonder what, what the future is for that pier, whether they're going to, it's going to cost an awful lot of money to make it safe. Um, and of course, after after that, of course, the Bell Steamers used to use it. And then, of course, it became headquarters for the Sun Tugs, which used to use it as well. And they were very important in the docks. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope they do something with it. Thank well, you. the old railway ferries was called Essex and Kent, the two boats. And when the Woolwich ferry started running, they bought a third one, which was a luxury boat. What they would call luxury anyway. People would pay that little bit extra not to have to sit on a boat with noisy lorries going everywhere. They were going across in quite plush seats. And I think it ended up as a floating clubhouse somewhere or the other. I think the Essex and the Kent, I think, met a fate that most ships end up, end up to. If um, Dave, uh, <clears throat> I didn't know, so that's something new I learned today. That the river, the river police would go to the schools to um, talk to children about the dangers of going into the River Thames. Um, I do know that some people who did swim in the river uh, survive because I have read uh, <laughs> some comments from people on Facebook about we used to go swimming in the summer. So if you did go swimming in the Thames by the Royal Lux area. Oh, well, I guess back in the time, back in the times you couldn't swim in the docks, which you can do now, by the way. Um, do leave us a comment. I'm interested to hear more about other people who did um, venture to go into the water, or if you ever know, uh, saw an incident, or you know uh, any friends, family members who went swimming, swimming, in, the, swimming in the river and, uh, got into trouble uh do let me know about the experience i'd like to hear that uh uh and perhaps you didn't go swimming but a lot of people did go to the beach or around the piers or around the slipways going through the the river and i read some comments on facebook about people courting and that being the place of of a first kiss so so yes if you're watching live do, do share those stories with us lisa what have people told you about going to the beach in Royal Docks? Not, not much. We, we've had a lot. We're happy to say they weren't really allowed to go. But uh, Guinness, she said she'd go down. But it wasn't really around swimming. It was more around like seeing what they could find and like playing with friends and trying to dig for stuff and kind of seeing what they could find on the foreshore. And yeah, the, no, no one spoke about swimming, but more that kind of mud darking side of trying to see what you can find and saying you know it was such like fun place and like you can just imagine um and find all these things and try and imagine what they were for or what, or what they do but she was said you know they'd go down to play but they certainly weren't allowed and they wouldn't tell anyone <laughs> 
So let's look at the next photo because we were just touching the subject. Ah, the wool, it's very. Fairy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Will Crux uh, in 1962. Then the John Burns. I think this photo is from the 1970s. Uh, this is the one that I did go on a ride, the Ernest Bevin. This photo uh, is from my husband took it from the other ferry uh, in 2017. Uh, this is one of uh, everybody's favorite, favorite things to talk about, the Woolwich Ferry, because the Woolwich Ferry was not only to go from A to B, it was not only to go from North Woolwich to Woolwich or South Woolwich. It was like a day out, wasn't it, Bob? And I think you do have a lot of memories of that's the way you would spend a weekend day. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, the, the point with the ferries, it was a front row seat for all the boats going past. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I mean, although you were not supposed to stay on board because it wasn't a tour ship, but I mean, if, if you behave yourself and it caused any any real problems, sort of, and they, they would turn a blind eye, and every now and again you'd get off of because there was always always two ferries running uh, and one ferry up on the hard um, being worked on overall, etc. Uh, so you'd get off one ferry and then you wait the next one coming and you go back on that one for a while. But you can see all the boats go past and immediately where you learn as I said earlier, you learn your geography from the ships of from the ships from their flags on their stands to the writing on their stands to which boats were coming. I mean, there's boats there, names of places which you, you just never hear of anymore. Having complete they've changed their names for various different reasons. But no, it was in the summer, not the fun place to be in the winter, but in the summer on the, old, the older style ferry, because they were open front and back. So you could sit there. So they were, were just like a cruise. <laughs> uh, when they changed to the, what I still call the new ferries, I know we've now got newer new ferries, <laughs> but I now call the new ferries. The view wasn't very good. I mean, you were not supposed to stand up on the, well, where the car deck was. You were not supposed to stand up on the top steps, but again, they turned the blind eye if you didn't mess around too much. But downstairs, you didn't get much of a view. Plus, they were um, they were just engine, and you didn't see anything. On the older style of ferries, you had to be with piston engines, and mm -hmm. that, and you see a sight of an engine of a paddle wheel going backwards and forward. It, it, it was a sight to see. And again, the engineers, if you stay in there, you could watch it going on, and they would very often explain bits and pieces pieces to you so you learnt your mechanics as well there so that they were an education as much as a, a service for getting people from A to B. Well, I like this idea so the ferry was not only a fun day out it was also part of your education if you could oh, yeah, take you, the opportunity. You learnt, you learnt a bit of mechanics you, you learnt geography and um, <laughs> you, you learnt design of ships and all the rest because <laughs> you had everything going past with the little tugs that used to just toot at you quite happily <laughs> right up to the big ships with the long drawn out horns, and you would have great fun. I say there's the Will Crooks, there was three or four of that style of ferry, and the Golden, uh, I forget what the others were offhand now. But as you see, you, you sit at the front. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I, I would have loved to go on a ride on this one. I, I only knew the new. The, the former new, <laughs> and I haven't I haven't tried the newest new. Uh, if you're watching live and you also uh, loved taking the ferry from shore to shore of the Thames, not only for transport, but to enjoy the river views, to see the ships, to go on a bit like a day trip, like a mini day trip, which is also free. So that's the great thing about the Woolwich Ferry, that it is absolutely free. So... Uh, it's transport, it's fun, it's educational, and you didn't have to pay for it. You still don't have to pay for it. Uh, Dave, what memories have you got from going on there? What, what did it mean for you and for your generation, the Woolwich Ferry? Well, unfortunately, I'm that funny age where I just don't remember the paddle steamers and all I remember is the <laughs> diesel boat. But my mum assured me that I did go on the paddle steamers in a, in a pram, so I did actually get that honour. Um, as a Silvertown kid, maybe North Woolwich was that little bit far too far away to go and lark about on the ferry as a as a youngster, but um, it played quite a, 
an important part in my you know, late teenage years because I always used to socialise south of the river. But um, there was just something about them, especially at night, if you were coming across one of the last crossings, all the factories in Silvertown had the lights on. And uh, they'd all be reflecting in the uh, in the Thames. And, of course, it was even more stunning when they built the Thames Barrier because that was more reflections. And it was a, a very calming sound from the engines, lovely smell. Um, there was just something magical about coming across late at night. And I always used to make sure that I got the last one if I was, you know, coming back home. Um, as a kid, no, I didn't really muck about on them. Um, we did, me and my best mate, Peter, at primary school, we did once bunk off uh, one lunchtime and we went over the ferry and we got a meat pie from a little shack just over the river and we come back again and the headmaster pulled us to one side and said, <laughs> you've been spotted on the ferry when you should be having your salad <laughs> at school and he whacked me, whacked me on the hand with his stick. I thought he was such a nice man, that Mr McGovern, but you know, he bloody beat me. <laughs> I suppose he's right, you know, you shouldn't do that. And the young kids shouldn't be mucking around on the ferry like that. Um, and I don't suppose the people who worked on there were that keen on people mucking about, but they understood that it was a really good thing to do locally because there wasn't an awful lot else to do. And you go and back, go backwards and forwards a few times. It was a great laugh and um, very calming. I always found it. And of course, the other thing that you, you're right. not mentioning is obviously the tunnel between North and South Woolwich. I mean, that would be used if the ferries weren't running because of thick fog or anything. And a lot of people, I remember I was working down there with, and had a young apprentice with me. And dinner time, I said, well, I'm going to pop over to, to um, the other side of the river. I said, we'll walk. And he like, looks at me as young apprentices do when some <laughs> daft tradesman tell them something really stupid. We're going, to, we're going to walk. What do you mean we're going to walk? So we went down the tunnel and, and cried. And he still didn't believe me till we popped up the other side. <laughs> and I went, over there. <laughs> it was it, it was a mystery um i say dave said he he, he used to cross the river back to, to socialize on that side of the river but i think a lot of people from both sides of the river never really crossed over it was just a case the ferry was just a, a form of transport to get from a to b i mean there was talk i don't know how true the story is but the railway line that come down to north Woolwich station the reason the station it is or was at an angle was hmm. supposed to be it lined up directly with the Woolwich Roundhouse Station. And okay. they were talking about a Thames Tunnel. I know that's the new thing, the Thames Tunnel at the moment, where we're going. There was talk about and being linked up. Now, I have no idea if that story is true, but if, if you look on the map, it would certainly make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were planning a tunnel in the 70s, I think, but it never got anywhere because there just wasn't any money around, was there? No, I think they, they, they've been planning a, 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 this tunnel. I think even, even when the railway first went went into it in the 19th century, I think the ultimate aim was to to link across that at, at Woolwich rather than having to use the, use the ferries, although obviously they were required for, tra for transport, but really making ferries transport only and then passenger side would, would run by trains. Because now we have the DLR doing exactly the same thing. Lisa, uh I guess people have talked to you about memories on the ferry and about the ferry. Lots, lots. And I, and I think it's a bit of both. It's, it's people that are going on the ferry and, and that's the, 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 be, the be all and end all. Actually, I haven't that many people actually sitting on top. Generally, when we've spoken to people, they've, they've talked about sitting in the engine room or sitting on the boiler and kind of almost the mechanical side being their favourite thing. Um, I pulled up this quote from Norma and she was saying... Um, that was on the old ferry. You could go down to the engine room. I loved it because it was all gleaming and shiny and the silver pistons go up and down and the smell of oil. And that that smell really stuck with her. And she really spoke about that and that kind of being a big day out. Um, but then on the other side, you also have it as like that form of transport to kind of do something. We had a lot of people that would talk about going to uh, the Saturday pictures over in Woolwich and kind of taking the ferry over and that kind of being a big, big, big day out. Um, for uh, the first first job, uh, Ginny spoke about uh, working in the grocers over in Woolwich, and so she'd take the ferry over every day and then come back. So it, it was also that kind of that other ritual, like the day out of being on the ferry, but then also it being a way of getting around. Uh, I forgot who it was, but they were talking about the fact that 
Yeah, if you wanted to go swimming in the pool, um, you either had to go, you either needed a bus fare, to, I forgot where she said she was going, but it was easier to go to Woolwich because the ferry was free, so she'd go swimming in Woolwich instead. And I think that's really interesting as well, though, even though it's further, um, because you got the free ferry, that kind of became part was of quicker. it. was quicker. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or people going over on the Woolwich ferry, but missing the last one back, so having to walk back home after a night out uh, through the tunnel. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of funny, funny stories. Ginny, she, she um, was really involved in rock and roll, and she, she was talking about going to the Odeon and seeing uh, Bill Haley, seeing Rock Around the Clock, and oh, they wow. were kind of there in the front, front seat so they could have a real dance. Uh, but the whole thing had to be shut down because on the old balcony in the Odeon, there were rockers dancing and jiving, and they thought the balcony was going to collapse, so it got it got cancelled, and they had to go home, which was really gutting. <laughs> so, if you are watching live and you also made a day out of going on the ferry, uh, let us know which memories have you got of uh, going on the Woolwich ferry just to go from A to B or just for pleasure to see the river views, and uh, keep the comments coming up because I can see already some I'm about to and I, I'm going I'm about to read some of them but before let's listen to another piece of our oral history recording this time with Marina it was okay it was really it was fun I think so I mean when we was a kid you during the war you had all the lorries and all that coming along there and all the um I remember when we was kids we'd stand at the bottom of the street and you'd get all the Americans on these when they're delivering on the boats um, as kids, we used to shout, I've got any gum chum? And they did. They used to give us all, you know, for us and sort of fruit and everything. And it used to be lovely, really. Yeah, and yeah. Chris, uh, New Year's dark time used to be lovely, really, because all the um, ships used to blow their arms and everything when it was New Year. It used to be so noisy then yeah. for New Year's. And it was like New Year, you know what I mean, celebrating. But today, yeah. you don't get nothing like that. Were people out on the streets celebrating at New Year? Yeah, it? oh yeah. I mean, you get people banging over dustbins and everything. Happy New Year to you and all. That's something a lot of people talk about, uh, one of the memories of, and I think we mentioned this uh, earlier, that we are talking about the sound of the dogs, an iconic visual image for a lot of people is new year's eve and all of the ships playing the horn and celebrating uh the new year dave uh, do you remember new year's eve i remember it very well yeah um so it'd be a bit of a killjoy but i think 15 minutes was enough <laughs> it didn't really have to go on <laughs> half an hour 45 minutes it got a bit boring after a bit and i just wanted to go to sleep <laughs> but opposite my house we had the um the andrew street tenants association club and of course they all used to turn out as well at midnight um falling out the door and banging various things and shouting so you couldn't miss it where i was it, it was more of an event than it is now i think i think most people spend it at home uh, doing their own thing i promise i would take some of the comments now uh i so said let's have a look uh royal dogs activities hub comment great photos i do agree so thank you so very much to newham archives and to east side community heritage for allowing us to use all those beautiful photos that we are seeing tonight and stay tuned because we have more photos to come uh, alexandra says my mom grew up near royal albert dog and remembers the queen passing by in her ship when she was a child. Oh, that's a, wow, that's a very important memory. Um, well, if any of you are watching tonight and you also have family members who have mentioned any of this, uh, Dave, have you ever heard of uh, the Queen passing uh, by in her ship? Yeah, there's uh, a very, quite a well-known photo that has appeared on our group quite a few times of uh, mm -hmm. all the crowds gathered at North Woolwich watching this ship go by. Yeah. Um, obviously a bit before my time again. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, there she I, I don't remember having seen this photo, so uh, Dave, I will have to have a look in the group and try to find it. Alexandra, I didn't know about this, and apparently, yes, we do have a photo of it in the Silvertown past and present group, so I'm going to try to 
and find the photo. And I'll tell you what, if I find the photo, if or if they find the photo, even after this has finished, uh, the, this video, this show is going to stay on the Thames Festival Trust uh, Facebook and YouTube page. So what about we try to find the photo and we ping it as a comment so more people can see the photo of the moment that Alexandra is describing her mom told her about. Uh, Alexandra, thank you very much uh, for this uh, comment, sharing this memory with us. Uh, uh, David Conroy, who is uh, a big friend of uh, this show. Uh, David, thank you very much for always tuning in and participating. I can't click on the link, but uh, I'm going to invite everybody to click on the link that David is sharing after after we have finished this show. Um, uh, Oh, that's, uh, that's the same memory from uh, the Clemens family uh, of the Queen passing uh, with her ship by the dogs. And we are going to try to find a photo and ping it as a comment because now I really, really want to, to say this. Uh, uh, and Alex says, even though we had moved away, my nan's street invited us back for the 1977 Silver Jubilee street party. It was fantastic. Is this one of the street parties we were talking about before this 1977 Silver Jubilee? Yeah, there was Le definitely one round our way for the Jubilee. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, it, uh, it is actually also very nice that she's talking, uh, sorry, Alex is talking about going back to the area even if they had moved uh, away. A lot of people still have this kind of like big connection with Silvertown and North Village. Uh, it's such a unique place and and it had such a unique sense of community that I, I, I believe that if, even if you move away, whenever you move back or you go back to visit, it might feel like you're going back home. Uh, if, By the way, if anybody has more memories from the 1977 Silver Jubilee Street Party, do leave us a comment so we can talk more about this. Uh, Lisa, this is not the party you were talking about. Uh, some people told you they had been preparing and then it was raining, raining, raining. I don't know. Uh, it's worth asking um, if you went. If you went to it, do you remember Alex being underneath um, Wolfen in the power block? And there would have been a band. Of, uh, I don't know if they would have been playing rock and roll, but, but they were a rock and roll band. Um, not sure if it would have been exactly appropriate for it. So would you believe Harley? Um, but yeah, it might be. Joey Newton says, "I don't think going." on the beach was encouraged at all, at least when I was growing up there. And that kind of, uh, Joey, I think you were absolutely right because that kind of um, links into what uh, Dave was saying that actually it was the opposite. The river police used to go to the schools to tell children, do not go on the beach, do not go in the water. Uh, it can be dangerous for you to do that. So um, although I have heard of people saying that used to go to the beach, that used to go swimming, it is true uh, what you're saying, that it was not something that people should have been doing. And it is true that you were not encouraged to do that. And so thank you very much for that, Joy. I agree. And thanks to Dave, I learned that you even, you even had the police visiting the schools to make sure children wouldn't do that. Um, Colin Granger says the slipway at Barge House Road has been used by generation of a smugglers of assorted goods. Hmm. Did you know about this? Dave, Bob or Lisa, had you heard about it? It's been rumoured. <laughs> <laughs> the rumours uh, going back a long, long while. Uh, Colin, I also wonder, what are you talking about when you talk about assorted goods? Is this, is it like a message between the lines here? I don't know. Booze. Ooh. Booze and cigarettes and tobacco. anything else that basically was wanted. I mean, what you've got to remember is they reckon that the crossing at North Woolwich, they reckon they used to cross there to go to Canterbury. Um, like with the Canterbury Towers, and the pilgrims mm. would cross, cross from Chelmsford across that point in the river on what would have been uh, like a rowing boat. So it, it's been river crossing there for years. And it's, I mean, the Vic Royal Victoria Park, 
and that's got some very interesting stories about goings on there and um because the um the ladies of the night would be there and it would be <laughs> causing problems uh they reckon the guy that owned it at one stage to escape from his creditors as he escaped from them in a hot air balloon i don't know how much of that is true and how much is that is just a, a myth I, over I the years i have heard that the story about uh, the hot it, balloon it, as it, well yes. um it, it was was it was famous in many ways and they reckon that you could literally buy anything for a pin from an elephant in there but, um again from off the boats i mean you, you get uh, the term doc cooper in which would be to open a barrel up take out spirits of whatever type you didn't take out a lot of it but you might take out a couple of bottles of it then put water in it because so, by the time it's actually reached its destination and slopped and rolled about that water would have dissipated in, in with the spirits and you, you wouldn't realize it it was weakened <laughs> and colin has confirmed what they he mean <laughs> by um uh, assorted goods that were smuggled through that uh barge house road uh, slippery a slip slipway slipway uh, yeah drugs cigarettes and alcohol nearly sounds like an oasis song children of the 90s like me will know what i'm talking about <laughs> drugs cigarettes and alcohol uh thank you very much for all the comments uh please keep them coming because i'm going to read all all of the comments at the end of the show let's catch up with some more of the photos we want to use to trigger more memories and um uh, this is something that uh oh sorry let me get rid of colin's uh message and um, yeah um going to school in the royal dog something that has already been sort of mentioned uh before uh that's drew a school that's pupils of West Ham School on the adopted ship, the MV Sugar Refinery, 1965. And children of West Ham School also on the ship. Uh, they having tea here and they are visiting the ship here. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about school memories uh, because going to school not only in royal dogs but in newham because these are school children are from west Ham school so not from royal dogs but near the area going to school at the time in the newham area at the time where the uh dogs were operating full steam uh in action was a very unique experience because we have heard of people talking like bob just mentioned earlier that ships were used by the teachers to teach and learn geography glennis for example glennis has also said to us at glennis web um that she remembers and colin and uh, uh, colin russell as well a couple of uh, uh ladies who grew up in the area have told us how they remember the teachers would say things like so okay children this ship coming from which country and going to which country and can you recognize the flag and could you put that country on a map so on one hand children in the royal docks area their teachers the schools used the ships coming in and out of the docks as a fun practical way of teaching geography through talking about from which countries the ships were coming and going to and which cargo were they bringing if they're coming from whichever countries are they going to be bringing fruit for example are they coming from uh countries with a tropical weather but also children from a schools all around newham so not only in royal dogs uh school children would adopt a ship and then once a year the children from the school would go and visit the ship and they would be invited to have some refreshments or some high tea uh so yeah let's talk about this uh uh dave do you uh, you said that in your in your case your school did not do it because you did not go to drew school no drew school pupils were really lucky they had a teaching uh method that involved the docs and they involved the kids in it and it was a wonderful mm. thing um, my school, which was St. Mary and St. Edwards in Newland Street, uh, didn't do anything like that. We didn't even have a camera and certainly no film to put in it. So we'd, we haven't even got like year pictures of classes or anything like that. So wow. again, Drew, you're very lucky because you had all that. I don't know what Story Street was like as a school, but I presume they were 
obviously better than, than our one, my one. Um, I don't like to dwell on it and regret on it because I could get really, you know, maudlin about it. But mm -hmm. I'd love to, I'd love to have pictures of my class as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it wasn't to be. Um, but again, when when using the school um, classroom, I never heard the clanking of cranes and ships. It was it was all behind closed windows. The teachers weren't interested in teaching us about what was going on over the dock fence. They didn't even teach us about the first or the second world war. You know, they were. They were just churning us out to read and write so that we could go and work in the local factories. And that was about, that was the, must have been their remit because uh, that's all they mm. ever did. Mm -hmm. Do I sound bitter and twisted? Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, you know what, uh, Dave, I think it's very important because if not, we only have one side of the story and I have this Id idyllic, iconic idea of all the children in the royal dogs, uh, the, the, the teachers telling them about the ships coming in and out and, and, you know, we're doing history and history is about recording the facts and what happened. So it is important to have your side of the story that you went to a school which was not making the most of it, which was not using the fact that they had the most important port in the world on, you know, on your doorstep and was not being used to, um, I don't know, to excite your um, creativity, your imagination, to, to to make education more fun. So yeah, that's uh, that has to be reported. So thank you for sharing uh, this, uh, Lisa. What have people told you about going to school or going to the dogs with as a as a school trip? Yeah, I mean, no one spoke specifically as much about school trips to the docks, but they spoke about kind of exploring the thing uh a ship that they kind of talk about or you know thing two is in the same which i think is so lovely um but most of the people because we're looking a lot of teenage experience as well and most of the people that we've spoken to were very ready to leave school when they could age 14 15 16. <laughs> we seem to have had a, a group of people that we've interviewed that all didn't enjoy school too much and they might have had good schools uh, or in, uh, but they just didn't, it wasn't so they were kind of ready to leave when when they could basically um it was i think Ginny was telling me a really funny story about uh, her class and she said she had one class that she really enjoyed which was the cooking class um but she was a bit loud and she said that um of all the teachers she had and um, you know, she really enjoyed this class she loved it the most but that her teacher that did cooking was definitely the teacher that also Hated her the most of all the school kids. <laughs> so it was a really strange thing. Uh, I think most people we spoke to were quite ready to leave school when they could, basically. And Bob, you had mentioned before how you did use or you tried to use uh, the ships around the dogs yeah. as a way of learning a geography. That was something you just did yourself. The schools didn't do it. I mean, I went to Kehardi School and then the Pretoria School, and they didn't follow the history up at all. I mean, I agree with Dave there, and again with a slight bitterness, that the schools in the East End, they wanted you fit and thick. It's, a simple, it's sadly the truth. They wanted you fit, there was plenty of sports, and they wanted you thick, basically read and write, but they didn't want you to have too much intelligence, because they just wanted you to be fit enough to go and work in the factories. And um, when people started to... Um, I suppose in the 60s, you really did start to get the first, um, I like the old song, Children of the Revolution. Children actually starting to think for themselves. I know when I, I said I wanted to be an apprentice electrician and I, I was after an apprenticeship, they sort of looked at you as like, why? <laughs> you know, you, you, why are you trying to better yourselves? And that was the, the school's way of looking at things. But no, we, we didn't do any, I mean, we did some school trips in, in secondary schools. I mean, we did a field studies tour all the way up to Norfolk, up to Norwich. But uh, regarding the docks, as I say, once we did the boat trip around, which was run by the PLA, but I don't ever remember us doing anything else like it at all. But it was by your own initiative that you did oh, use yes. the yes. ships to learn geography. Because as you, you lived there, as we, we said earlier, we didn't think it was anywhere special. I mean, now you look back and you think, God, oh. <laughs> but you didn't. It was... It was just a natural thing to be down by the river. I mean, so I was at, at Canning Town, so we had the River Lee as well. So you get some of the smaller boats would go pass up through there. We had a big wood factory at um, 
Canning Town and they would go up to there. And of course, you had the shipbuilding at Canning Town with the Thames Iron Works. I'm actually wearing a, a Case lifeboat badge <laughs> here because the connection is with Caster is that the, some of their boats were built at the Thames Iron Works, including the famous Beauchamp, which, which was lost for all her crew. So there are, are connections with that. But regarding schools, no, they didn't. I mean, as you know, it's a bit of a soapbox of mine that we should, not especially with the, the more and more immigrants that are coming in, we should teach local histories to make the kids feel more at home and do they recognise their worlds. Although their worlds are changing so much. I don't think if I went back to Canada, I'd recognise too much of my world. But that is why we need to... We know it's not on the school curriculum and all the rest of it, but I think if we talked local history, the kids would become a bit more feeling like they're home and not like they'd go home and talk to their parents and explain things to them about their world, which I think would improve things. But that's just my soapbox. No, I do agree. And especially having had this conversation with you and with Dave uh, today, like, if it was today, if we had the dogs today, probably every school would be teaching the children, guys, you live by the biggest port or one of the biggest ports in the world. And you have all these ships coming from New Zealand and from America and from Australia, and they bring in this and bring in that, and, and they come with the tides and whatever. Um, and 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 it is it is a bit a discovery for me to realize that, for example, Dave, you were saying, yes, you 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 took those ships there for granted, but nobody told you, do you know that it is actually the biggest port in the world? You know how important this place is in the in the in in the map of the universe. And uh and yes, so that's a discovery that things that we take for granted um that wasn't explained to children, the importance of the place you were living in. And and the, and the, and yeah and, and and everything that drew a school did do which okay we have an amazing opportunity here to make education more fun by using those ships because nobody else in the world has these ships here so let's use them to teach children okay where do oranges come from where do bananas come from where have we got good weather in the world to produce this fruit what is this fl this flag on this ship which country is it can you put the country on a map so. I mean, I, I love geography, but I would have loved geography more if I had been taught geography this way. Let's have a look at some more photos. And again, if you're watching this live and you do have memories or comments or you want to add to the conversation, do leave a comment because I'm going to come back to the comments in um, a minute's time. Um, this photo, I do have a personal um, agenda here, being that I love Royal Victoria Gardens. It's one of my favorite places in London, like having the park uh, by the river. So you, I mean, depending where you are, you can see to your right, a lot of green to your left, all the water. It's one of the most beautiful riverside parks in London, uh, but, Although I have spent a lot of time in Royal Victoria Gardens, I have never seen this because by the time I moved to Royal Docks, this structure had disappeared. So I have no idea what it is and I have no personal memories of what one would do here. So um, Dave, help me. Yeah, it was just a viewing platform and it had a small uh, confectionery area where you could buy ice creams and stuff like that i don't think it, it wasn't a fully fledged cafe it, it was probably i think i read on the uh group it was run by a local concern maybe one of the local shops had a concession there to do that in the summer mm -hmm. um it, it was just part of the furniture i mean it appeared and then it disappeared and whether we missed it or not i don't know but <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a nice place to hang out sometimes um not the most beautiful place in the world but it gave you a much better view of the river. So, and uh, I can see it's called Sun Lounge. Sun, Sun, Sun Lounge. A part of it is kind of like walled, covered, and the other one is sort of exposed so you could sun bath, get a bit of a tan. Yeah, apart from the great concrete roof on it. Um, <laughs> the, I can see a bench there. So obviously you could, you know, two or three people could look at the Thames and the boats going by, but that was about it. Um, in the height of summer, I don't remember it being boiling hot. I think it was quite quite well positioned. It was quite cool. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, you had the trees shading it as well. Yeah, it was, it was a nice little experience when you went to the park. Something different. Rather than buying your sweets on the way into the park, you could actually get them in there. Bob, do you remember it ever seeing I, it I don't park? remember it at all. I mean, I've seen that photo a couple of times sort of thing, and it, it must have been in that period when I didn't go down to that part of the world because I definitely don't remember it at all. And it's mm-hmm. the sort of structure that you would stick would stick in your mind because it, it must have been in a, a flat part, being the fact you could stand up and, and see the boats go past. It, it must have been quite a spectacular thing, but say, sadly, I don't remember it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lisa, have you ever have you been told about this place? I've heard people talk about um, Victoria Garden and just how much they love the park and going there. Um, people talking about that being kind of their favourite park and that it's almost been overtaken a little bit by the Thames Ferry Park more recently and that there, there was almost kind of that shift from one to, to next. Hmm. Um, but not that specific structure now. And I got another photo that I think I've got a question to Dave because uh, uh, you you shared this photo in the group, Dave. Uh, you said the photo is from John King. And although this is not in North Village, I believe this is a place where a lot of uh, teenagers and young people from North Village used to go to. What is this, Dave? Um, there was a lot of really interesting shops in Woolwich, and this this particular one would have been opposite, uh, virtually where they built that massive Tesco's now. Um, they knocked it all down across all these streets, but there were so many little junk shops um, and places where you could buy second-hand records and second-hand musical equipment. There seemed to be a never-ending uh, supply of it, but then they all vanished uh, virtually overnight. Um you have to say that if you wanted something and you lived in Silvertown and North Woolwich, you went either to Canning Town or you went to Woolwich because that's where all the big shops were. You could virtually get anything you wanted in Woolwich at the time. Um, and if you had a look around, I mean, okay, most people stuck to the, the main shopping streets of Hare Street and Power Street, but they had all these interesting little ones around the back and uh, I could spend all day rummaging around in them and finding all sorts of treasures. And Lisa, talking about swapping uh, albums, uh, music is a big part of uh, being young. I mean, uh, the, the, the songs that are important to us when we're growing up, when we are teenagers, those songs stay with us forever. And I believe uh, when you were collecting memories from people growing up in Royal Dogs, uh, music and the sounds of their childhood and the, uh, the sounds of their teenage year, years are a p- big part of the story. I know you want to tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, we've had loads of people talk about music. I think because we focus on the teenage period, I think music brings back so many strong memories so it's naturally something that people gravitate to. But actually looking at the uh, swap, and sh- uh, swap shop um, reminds me of Norma. She was talking about, she spoke a lot about music. She was a bit of a mod. Um, listening to Marla Mota was kind of favorite thing and she talked a bit about tuning into Radio Luxembourg uh, but then when she finally got her own record player she said she used to spend all of her money from working uh, in Selman which is on Barking Road uh, which was a record shop and she said that was kind of for her the best place to buy records and she could find wherever she wanted and she, she basically yeah she spent all her money on that um, but music was such a big thing in terms of what people spoke to us about and kind of going out dancing um, and some of that was going out to say Ilford Palais or going uh, down to Woolwich. Um, but then a really big part was also just the fact that a lot of the pubs had music. You know, live music was just part of part of what was going on. You know, you'd have bands playing rock and roll, um, which I think a lot of people have a lot of strong memories about and, and that being able to kind of go out on a Saturday night or Friday night. You might go with your family. You probably, a lot of people who go to didn't actually drink, but they just go for that kind of again the community feel, music, and um, to hang out. Oh, another really nice thing was kind of the dances that people spoke about. So the was really big. Uh, the uh, Stratford Town Hall was also a really great place to dance, and a lot of people spoke about meeting their husbands or, or their future wives 
going to the dances and kind of having a cup of tea or having a lemonade and kind of dancing the night away to kind of um, dive bands and good bands and, and that being like a really special occasion where you really kind of dress up, get ready and it was kind of a really good place to meet people. So we're interested in what would they, did you ever go to any of the dances or kind of what are places where you go to listen to music? Um. I actually did standbys at the Stratford Town Hall while I worked as a spark for Newham. Um, <laughs> we were responsible for setting the mics up and making sure that all worked and lighting and all the rest of it. And what you used to have also at East Ham Town Hall when they had what they call mayor making, which was the, the new mayor coming in, mm -hmm. we used to spend three days with the lights. I mean, the lighting arrays at the Town Hall was in three phases so we used to have one phase blue one phase yellow one phase pink so and then the lights around the top of the uh, hall was the same uh, and so we could all, all the phasing of the lights so they can have different colors for different dancers but i never actually attended any of them as, as a dancer i always attended them as a worker uh, this up uh, so, sorry uh dave you were going to add no, I was just going to say that towards the end of the 70s and the early 80s, um, you could see an awful lot of fantastic bands in Canning Town and Woolwich. Um, Canning Town, the Bridge House, I first saw Depeche Mode there do their first gig, and it cost me 60 pence to get in. <gasps> and, and then I, I kept going to see them every few weeks or so, and I, I saw them turn into this little band from Basildon into pop stars that were on top of the pops. Yeah, that was a really amazing journey. <laughs> um, but also across the Thames in Woolwich, you had the Thames Poly who put on some great bands. You had the Tram Shed. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe people in Silver, Silvertown and North Woolwich didn't sort of enter into that kind of indie era, which which I did because I didn't see a lot of regulars in the Bridge House or any local sort mm -hmm. of clubs in Woolwich. But yeah, if you was into that music, it was really happening around that time. Um, you saw a lot of bands who were coming up who who did go on to bigger and better things. And if they were playing in one of the venues in Woolwich, you could go for free because you could take the Woolwich ferry, which is free. Yeah, it's always <laughs> good to walk to and from somewhere and entertainment wise, yeah. <laughs> and um, I've got a photo that. Sorry. So you had a lot of people talk about the bridge house as well in talking about the past. That kind of that happen there as well, which I thought was quite nice. I've got a photo that might not be necessarily for uh, Bob and for Dave because you grew up, or when you were children at least, uh, the dogs were in full, um, yeah, uh, they were like um, full steam operating. They, were active, uh, a lot of work, a lot of things happening in the dogs. But um, if you're watching this live or you watch this afterwards, when, when you're going to still leave a comment, even if we are not live, I'd like to hear from people who were children or grew up in the dogs when the dogs were closing, when things got really, really difficult, because there must be such a contrast between growing up in the dogs when you have all of the ships, all of the activities. And because all of the industries surrounding the dogs, you had a lot of shops in the dogs, uh, you had a lot of banks, pubs, uh, cafes, and suddenly all of that disappears when the dogs close. And the dogs go from being a place full of life and full of things to do to um, full of places where you can do shopping or go to the pub with your family or go to a cafe or, um, and you can see the sheep and you have all of these exciting things happening around you and everybody is happier because uh, there is jobs for everybody to so suddenly the dogs becoming a place where things got really really tough for people uh, with the closure of the dogs and everything that closed when the dogs also closed and it became very difficult for the families living there and that would have had a, reper a repercussion in the children uh, growing up in the area in the 70s and the 80s when the royal dogs became a bit of a delirious area uh, so if you're watching this and you didn't grow up grow up in the 50s or 60s when we had kind of like kind of like the second golden age of the dogs but you grew up in the dogs in the 70s and the 80s when things got really really difficult when things were closing and disappearing please leave a comment and especially if you remember having joined any of these 
um, uh, community meetings or marches, uh, asking for something to happen in the docks if they were going to close, what was going to happen with all the community we need work we need things happening here if you were part of these movements uh, i would like to hear from you do leave a comment either now or, or later because uh the show is going to stay on the thames festival facebook page and we can always come back and read all of your comments talking about which uh more comments um Kevin says, and uh, we're now talking about when we were talking about swimming or not in the river. Kevin says, I have swum in the river and dived off the pier. I know there was a bright slide, but I'm still here to tell the tale. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. I was asking about, do people remember uh, uh, swimming in, uh, in the river? and i wanted to hear from some from someone who did swim in the river because i did remember people commenting on the photos and on the facebook on the facebook groups about swimming in the river although it was a bit of a dangerous thing to do we're not encouraging people to do it we're just telling this happened um other comments uh, uh kate says lovely memories love the image of the factory lights shining over the river at night so evocative i completely agree when dave was telling us about if you could catch the last ferry back home from one shore to the other shore of the thames and you could see all of the factory lights and the room room from the engine of the of the boat it was a very like chill out relaxing magical um a scene and dave as you were describing it I could picture it. So yeah, I do agree. It was a very evocative uh, message, um, uh, memory. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Joey says, I must have crossed over to Woolwich hundreds of times from Saturday morning pictures at the Granada and shopping for, shopping for my mom at Powys Street at 15 i had a saturday job in woolworths woolworths sorry i don't know how to pronounce this and also i went to school every school day for five years in kidbrook so yeah uh, as we were saying uh dave you you were mentioning this like uh anything that you couldn't find in north woolwich if you could find everything in south woolwich or woolwich so getting the ferry to go to the shops, to go dancing, to go to a music concert, to do the shopping for the family. That was um, a thing to do for people in the area. Um, okay, uh, so Joey, I think Joey is talking about when school children were invited to their sh adopted ship. I think the Drew School had a Glenorchy uh, as one of the ships they adopted. Uh, Joey, if, if you were asked, uh, drew a school school children and the Glenorchy was uh, the adopted the adopted ship for drew a school please uh, write a comment uh, so I know I'm saying the right thing or not to correct me and Joey is talking about earlier we were uh, we saw some we saw some we saw some photos of uh, school children uh, the photo in particular I showed uh, was a photo of West Ham school children in a different ship but we were talking about this like school children adopting a ship and then being invited to go on board uh, to the ship, to visit the ship and also to have some nice refreshments uh, or high tea. And in fact, they were, they were nice refreshments because Joey is confirming she had her first taste of apricot jam at the Glenarchy on board on a ship in the Royal Dogs. Uh, Colin says, at Drew, we were the first New Amma school to take a party of children abroad on a school trip. We went to France and we all got our first taste of wine on the beach and also our first taste of French bread and cheese. See what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I'm so sorry you didn't go to Drew school. The, all the things you missed. 
<laughs> uh, Colin, that's fantastic. I, um, I've been to um, school trips with my school, but not never to a school trip where I could have my first taste of wine on the beach. I mean, Druva school children were indeed really, really, re really lucky. Uh, David Conroe says, uh, David Conroy says, St. Mary as an Edwards taught the main subject material excellently and several of us in 1966-68 went on to take, went on to take A-levels and higher education. However, the draw in the area was to leave school as soon as possible and earn a decent wage in Tate and Lyle and other establishments, including Gingles opposite the California pub. I know where the California pub used to be. Uh, I, I, I can I don't know how to explain it. I can't picture it. It was more or less in front of one of the entrances to Royal Victoria Gardens. Is that correct, Dave? It's near enough. Yeah, uh, yeah the California was sort of like one end of the park. Um, uh, but I don't know what Ginger's was that David is no, talking it, about. No, it's probably a, an older factory. I don't, I don't recall that name either. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm. F I think David is talking about the Sun Lounge, and he's saying, "I'm cer I'm fairly certain it was built at the same time as they raised the river walls for flood protection, in advance of the Thames barrier." Yes, he's definitely talking about the Sun Lounge in Royal Victoria Gardens because he's even adding, "Definitely a kissing center." I mean, I can, I can, I can picture people going in up to the Sun Lounge for their first kiss, and. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice romantic place in the park uh, next to the water. Uh, and let's have a look at the last photos of today. Let's make this. So David is talking about a kissing center. Uh, let me remind you what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, you got the river in front of you, you got uh, you're surrounded by the trees and the birds and all the flowers. Definitely a kissing, a kissing hub in in Royal Victoria Gardens. A kissing hub in Royal uh, Docks for people who grew up or were teenagers in that area. And of course, uh, if we're talking about children and teenagers, sports is a big part of it. Uh, this photo we can even see our friend Colin Granger, who has been commenting today. I think, Colin, I think you're the one holding the trophy. This photo is the Lyle Park Cup winners, 1964-1965. Uh, but of course, because we had the water, we had to make use of it. And for example, when we did no longer have the dogs, the water was utilized in the 90s to uh, organize uh, the London Youth Games, including regatta races. Uh, we, I love this picture because uh, this is I've never seen uh, anything like this the years that I was uh, living in the docks. And so uh, again, if you if you did participate in some of these uh, ga water games uh, in the docks when the docks were closed and the, and they were trying to use the water in a different way, do leave a comment uh, because of the maritime heritage then this has become a theme so even in the um, ferry festival two or three years ago we organized sports um, game for children but under a maritime heritage theme so for example we had um, a boat race and all the children participating had to be dressed dressing up as um, dockers or or even boats um they they had a we had we did like an arts and crafts sessions and the children were building their own boats and they could run in the boat and yeah so we have football which yeah uh we will have seen people playing football uh, regatta we have seen the photos and we can imagine why they would use their royal looks water water area to the regattas. Uh, we have a boat race to play tribute to the maritime heritage whilst playing a sport. But I'm going to show you a photo I had never ever seen. 
what is this, Dave? <laughs> New I'm riding a school. I didn't know about this. And this is at Camel Road in Silvertown. Yeah, this was the view from my parents' house in Camel Road, number 11. Um, Newman Riding School was set up by um, Linda Greaves um, initially under the uh, viaduct just, just past that, that photo. And, of course, Bill Dunlop got involved as well. He was a local councillor. And they used to run a riding school for local children. Um, now, despite its humble beginnings, it's still going strong. It's now based in Beckton somewhere. But um, I, I sent you this photo because um, on the leading horse there, that's my cousin, Bobby Watts, ah. who lived in Parker Street. And it, it was quite a regular occurrence to see them all going by the house. And my dad used to scurry out and collect all the droppings because he had some rose bushes. So that was killing two birds with one stone. It was nice to see the horses going by. And, um, you know, all congratulations to Linda and Bill, who pulled off something really incredible in, in Silvertown, I thought. It's so, such an incongruous thing. I'm really grateful for this photo because, I mean, as I said, I have never seen this photo and I didn't even know that there was a new and bright in a school and that the origins of the new and bright in a school were in the Royal Looks, what on the corner from the Royal Looks, and, and to have people um, like children going horse riding um, across the streets of Silvertown is such an amazing thing, which I had no idea. I mean, it's um, yeah, it's funny how there are a lot of things that we know a lot that we keep talking about from the Woolwich Ferry and the uh, or Tate and Lyle or people going to Royal Victoria Gardens, but. I think this photo, uh, if you allow me to say this, uh, Dave, this photo shows why it is important that we continue doing projects like this and having conversations like this and uh, doing shows like this and, and events and all our history recording and history projects because although we sometimes think we already know everything about the history of an area, there's always so much to discover. So you, you, by having shared and sent us this photo today, you are, you, that, that's the proof that we need to have to keep having this conversation. So all of the things that happen uh, don't go forgotten. So thank you very much for this photo today. I'm going to have a look at what's the last comment of tonight. Uh, okay, so uh, we had a we had a question about what was the gingels which david was mentioning that it was one of the places where um teenagers were expected to find a job if not in tate and lyle when they left the school and we didn't know i didn't know what gingels was i do know where the california pub was so we had asked this question and uh kevin russell thank you very much kevin is answering the question it's, uh, he says it, it was a cabinet factory i worked there for a few years and it was behind the roundhouse pub which makes sense because yeah, the roundhouse was one end of the street and the California pub was the other end of that street. And and David was talking about the, uh, the gingers being next to or in front of the California pub. Uh, and David says, David is asking somebody called Melanie to post more pictures of the riding center. So yes, please, after we finish this show, do comment, leave more comments, share your stories and post photos of anything we have talked about today and especially photos of stories that we didn't know about like that ride in a school in Newham that took uh, children riding horses around the streets of Royal Dogs and I think we have to wrap it up for today but before we go I have a last video with a short um, what a history recording and I chose this for the end because it's about let me get it ready it's a uh, marina it was okay it was it's uh and when the dock stopped yeah so this this is a very special oral history recording uh fragment because it's a it's from a lady called Doreen let me make uh David come and disappear and she's talking about the noises all the noises in the royal looks but what is really really significant is that what she's then saying is that when the dogs closed she was finding it difficult 
not to hear all of those noises. And this is very connected to how we started the show, that I was asking all of these questions today about weren't you shocked, surprised, marveled by living by all these ships and all the noise. And, and it was so part of your micro universe that you nearly didn't take notice of it. It was part of your microcosmos. I think you used that word and I really like that, uh, Dave. You said it was part of my microcosmos, all those ships and the noise. So it was part of part of your environment. But when it went, that's a big shock. When all those noises disappear, that is a big shock. So um, I thought that was a nice way of finish, a nice way of finishing today to, to be aware of how much it meant to people when the Royal Dogs closed. Uh, so with that thought, I will play this um, audio in a moment. And in the meantime, let me say to all of you who watched tonight or who will be watching later on replay, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. Next one will be in July and will be about the Ferry Festival because it's time to get to get festive. Uh, so I hope you uh, tune in again for episode five of the Islanders. And it was this was all from us, episode four. But let's uh, put an end with this very, very significant and special um, piece of audio. And when the docks stopped, you won't believe it. And I still lived down there and the ships went. I couldn't go to sleep. What, when they went? When they went, because you're used to the the trains and that, the uh, uh, coming up and getting the cargo and that, and the crashing and the banging and the ships blowing up. And it took me ages to go to sleep because I was used to that noise. Mm. I've always been used to the ships going blowing up because we live right on the dock. Mm. And then the bustle and the men going into the dock as well. Mm. And at 12 o'clock, you'd get out of the way. You wouldn't be on the street because the men would be that busy coming out the docks and they would be going over the ferry under the tunnel, up your streets. If you were going shopping over the river, then <laughs> always make sure you weren't coming through the tunnel because the men were using the lift. 